Cancer Prevention Month in Multnomah County, Oregon. So moved. Second. Commissioner Myron moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R6. Good morning. John, I think you're up. Good morning. All right. Uh, good morning, Chair Kapori, Commissioner Myron, uh, Commissioner Stegman, Commissioner uh, Beggar Peterson. Uh, good to see you all. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard. Um, my name is John Casolino. I'm the Chief Deputy District Attorney in the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office. Uh, I'm here today for you to jointly recognize that this is Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, I'm joined virtually, I think they're on there, uh, by uh, the Medical Director of CARES Northwest, Dr. Benpei Adewusi, Senior Deputy District Attorney of our Multidisciplinary Child Abuse Team, Amity Gert and our MDT coordinator and victims advocate, Malia Bruni. This morning, I was gonna say a few mar remarks. Dr. Adewusi will then say a few remarks. And then this is our high-tech performance here that um, Ms. Gert and Ms. Bruni will each read half of the proclamation uh, that, um, yeah, that's as far as we, we could go. No, no video montage that you may have seen or you will be seeing. Uh, first, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about prevention efforts. And, and as I see prevention efforts for child abuse, they're really in three spots. One is directed at the general population. One is at families where risk factors may be present. And the third is where families where maltreatment has already occurred. As we know, since the beginning of the pandemic, there have been extreme challenges associated with the intervention, assessment, investigation, and treatment of child abuse and neglect. I can't stress enough how intervention is part of prevention. According to the Oregon Department of Human Services data, people often identified as responsible for child abuse are most often family members, making up 93%. If we add neighbors and friends, that brings us to 96%. As we all know, in April before, uh, or I should say before April 2020, uh, when kids were, were at school, the largest group who made safety calls to the Oregon Child Abuse Hotline were school employees. That's no surprise. Right, that, but that is no longer the case. Kids no longer have the same access to that trusted teacher or administrator. Um, I wanted now just briefly to give you an idea of, of the practice in Oregon. In Oregon, members of our MDT use a pro, pro, protective factors approach to the prevention of child abuse and maltreatment. We focus on positive ways to engage families by emphasizing their strengths and what parents and caregivers are doing well as well as identifying where families have room to grow with support. In practice today, we look at experiences of early childhood, including early trauma exposure that have lifelong impacts on brain development. We look at the effects of adverse childhood experiences. You've heard me talk about ACEs before, such as child abuse and neglect on physical and mental health that last well into adulthood. We seek investments and in prevention strategies to keep children safe, families strong and communities resilient, because we really know that this will pay dividends well into the future. I have to say that many of these concepts when I began in our MDT uh, back in our child abuse unit back in 2005, they were new or on the cutting edge of practice. Now, thankfully, all these things are accepted truths. They form the basis of some of today's most effective prevention strategies, including home visiting programs, therapies to strengthen parent-child bonds, neighborhood-based family resource centers, and multidisciplinary child abuse teams like we have in Multnomah County. All this causes me to look forward rather than backward. I'm gonna end my remarks with this. We must concentrate on three societal factors that play a significant role on how we can effectively support all our families and prevent child abuse and, and neglect. One, we have to be respectful and promote social and cultural norms that prevent abuse. Two, we have to support federal, state, and local policies that reduce abuse. And three, we have to have equal and equitable access for all our families to resources and opportunities. All this, even in the face of a pandemic, gets me excited about all we can achieve in the future to make sure we protect children and strengthen families. And with this, it gives me great ple pleasure to introduce Dr. Adewusi, the Medical Director of CARES Northwest. Dr. Adewusi, uh, are you on? Yes, yeah. I am. Can everyone hear me? Okay. 
So good morning, everyone. Um, yep. I always like to tell people that child abuse work kind of fell into my lap. Um, people ask me why I continue to do this difficult work, and I often tell them a story of a patient of mine who was a teenager I saw who was sexually abused. I was waiting to testify in the trial, and the prosecutor had told me that the defense attorney had been giving the teenager a hard time, especially alluding that she had, was lying about the whole incident. So while I was sitting outside the courtroom, my eyes locked with her, and then she came and sat next to me. She then asked me, are you on my side? Are you here for me? I replied, of course I am, and she sighed in relief. When this work gets hard with narratives of children becoming more and more difficult to hear, I remember this interaction. But then 2020 came, and it was an awful year, and has seemingly continued into 2021. In March 2020, our country started to deal with the COVID pandemic. What we all soon realized is that despite all the chaos that came with the pandemic, life still went on, which was now confounded by job loss, death, a rise in social justice movements, and grief. With students not in school, our key mandated reporters suddenly did not have access to children as they used to, and reports to CPS hotlines decreased. Knowing this, I often go back to that interaction with the teenager and worry about the children I'm not able to be on their side or be there with them. Research and clinical practice points to joblessness, homelessness, domestic violence, mental health issues as all risk factors that can lead to more incidents of abuse. I know child abuse continues to occur during this unprecedented time, and COVID has widened the gap disproportionately for BIPOC communities. Being the first BIPOC person in, leader, in a leadership position at CARES Northwest, this concern, this concern continues to sit on my shoulders as I look to the future. It's not only important for, to support kids and be on their side, but we have to use um, tools that have been set out by the CDC to prevent child abuse before it ever happens. We do this by promoting healthy relationships and healthy boundaries. CARES Northwest prevention work is about coaching and supporting communities to produce less people who will harm others. I hope that Portland is able to embrace months such as this to support and promote organizations with goals to help prevent child abuse, whether it's through the Portland's Children's Levy or even with the prevention work that we do here at CARES. Thank you. If you're on mute, John. Thank you. First meeting, first remote meeting. Uh, uh, we were going to now uh, read the proclamation by uh, Ms. Gerd and Ms. Bruni. I think Ms. Bruni is next. Hi, good morning. My name is Malia Bruni, and as John said, I'm the victim advocate and MDT coordinator with the district attorney's office. Thank you so much for having us this morning. Proclaiming the month of April 2021 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Multnomah County, the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners finds Child abuse and neglect is a serious public health and safety problem that impacts all of our community. And finding solutions requires input and action from everyone. According to the most recently published Oregon Department of Human Services Child Welfare Data Book published in 2020, there were 89,451 reports of child abuse and neglect in Oregon in 2019. In Multnomah County, there were 17,236 reports of abuse and neglect. The most common family stress factor when child abuse was present was substance abuse. The next most common stressor was domestic violence. Child abuse and neglect have long-term physical, psychological, emotional, and social effects that have lasting consequences for survivors of abuse into adulthood. Due to the global pandemic this past year, the challenges to protecting children were more acutely felt. Reporting to the Oregon Child Abuse Hotline declined as children had less frequent contact with mandatory reporters. Hi everyone, I'm Amity Gert with the Multnomah County DA's office. I supervise our MDT Child Abuse Unit. And so I'm going to take up the rest of the proclamation that continues with uh, noting that all of us in Multnomah County must work together to increase awareness about child abuse and contribute to promote the social and emotional well-being of children and families in a stable, safe, nurturing environment. 
We must all recognize the signs of child maltreatment and take appropriate steps to safeguard children by reporting concerns and connecting families with the help that they may need. Effective child abuse prevention and intervention efforts succeed because of coordinated partnerships between the government, between child welfare, health, school, law enforcement, and community organizations that foster and adoptive parents, child protective workers, faith leaders, community mentors, medicine, mental health, teachers, and law enforcement officials all have a role in protecting and supporting children who have been tragically abused or neglected. The um, proclamation goes on to uh, finish uh, what the uh, County Board of Commissioners would proclaim, and I can go ahead and read that. I'm not really sure if I'm supposed to or if the County Commissioners take that up at this point. Um, but it goes on to read that. OK, goes on to read that the commissioners proclaim that the month of April 2021 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Multnomah County and that the Board of County Commissioners call upon our community to support the effort to prevent child abuse, protect children and strengthen families adopted this 15th day of April 2021. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations on successfully sharing the reading of the proclamation. Tasha, did we receive any public testimony on this item? Um, no, Madam Chair, we did not. All right. Um, questions, comments from commissioners, uh, starting with Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for the bringing this proclamation uh, here today and um, and for all the work that you do um, every day uh, and with so many others to um, to prevent uh, and address child abuse in our in our communities. Um, I I had one. I do have a question actually um, pertaining to the you know I. I'm kind of scared of what the the answer is going to be, but. Um, you know, you you alluded to there were there were so many, you know, just staggering number of incidences that have been were reported of abuse in uh, 2019. And just uh, I am really worried about what the impact is on sort of the decrease in uh, children's interaction with potential mandatory reporters. Uh, during 2020 with uh, COVID, et cetera. And I mean, do you have any estimate of estimates of what, because it it's a concerning uh, combination of both, uh, I suspect an increase in the number of cases given the stressors that are impacting families uh, along with the decrease in the interaction with trusted uh, potential reporters. And that's um, so incredibly concerning. Can you can you speak to what you have seen or experienced in terms of of that sort of disparity there and um, and what's what you're doing or what you've seen being done to address that? So, uh, Dr. Adewusi, do you want to go first on some some figures I know you have from CARES? Yeah, I don't have specific numbers. I could talk probably anecdotally. Um, yes. I, we have the same concern, or at least I have the same concern, is um, what I can speak to is right now, before COVID, we usually had um, a two week wait for appointments. So like we would schedule out about two weeks. Now we are scheduling out a month to six weeks. And I think it also is because we're trying to distance appointments, but that's a significant amount of appointments that are being filled. And um, and then we don't have as many providers, but there is an increase in appointments being seen um, right now. I think we kind of are in this surge where we're starting to hear of them because I think kids are going back mm -hmm. to school. Yeah. Um, and then I will say the things that we're being told, the stories are worse and just a little bit more dramatic than they used to be. Um, I also see consults at the hospital 
um, and we are seeing a little bit more ingestions. Um, and I think that probably has to do with parents having to work at home, not maybe having eyes on their children. Um, we saw ingestions all the time, but they just seem to be. And before, I think people had a little bit more inkling of what was going on that the child got into the whatever it was. But now they they're just like, I don't know. I woke up and my child looked like that. So. Um, we're seeing it, it's slow. I worry about the fall. If we do go back to full in-person school, I think we're gonna see a humongous surge. I just don't even know if we have the capacity to see all the kids in a timely fashion. Yeah, and thank you. If I can add just a little bit to frame it, uh, Commissioner Myron, you know, kids love summer break and I used to too, but summer always makes me cringe because those are the months as you, you know what I'm going to say. I know you know what I'm going to say. Yes. Those are the months um, that kids are not around their trusted uh, teacher or maybe even a good family friend. And so we'll see a decline in the summer months, but then come September when school opens up and then kids get some feel safe or, or get a better rapport with their new teacher, we start seeing the reports go up in late September and October. So imagine summer vacation now on, I don't know, steroids? Is that even a right way to say it? <laughs> um, and so that's that big bubble that Dr. Adewusi is talking about. And I just wanted to highlight a, one thing she said, the cases are getting worse or worse, right? Or more extreme because right there's that length of time that we weren't able to intervene and so more incidents are happening to address one issue that you said what are we doing you know we've kind of started to um, believe it or not our office isn't just reactive but it's preventative we've started to uh, reach out more to to go into the classrooms and talk about internet safety with teachers parents um, and administrators right now our kids are more online savvy than they've ever been which is great but seeing the dark side again they're more exposed than they've ever been so that's one concrete step that we're taking to address that with education in an appropriate way uh, to kind of uh, lessen that impact and i don't i don't know if uh, amity gert our senior deputy at uh, mdt wants to add anything or Sure, John, I'll just add um, that, you know, as Dr. Adewusu was talking about the kind of the lull in the cases that we had saw early on in the pandemic, we saw that too at the DA's office. We were seeing uh, fewer case referrals. We were seeing a much longer time period go by before detectives could get us cases. Um, and we saw fewer uh, uh, cases coming to us to review for several months. That has that has now significantly picked up. We're getting plenty of cases in the door. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we're not getting hardly any cases out the door. And so our criminal caseloads have done nothing but climb as a result of that for the last year or so. And we're now at record high case numbers of child abuse awaiting trial or resolution. So that's how I see it on my end of things. Thank Okay. They, yeah. Um, I, I I had a feeling I wasn't going to want to hear hear about these, except it does highlight how again that appreciation for all of you being there and the preventive work you do. And then, just one other um, quick question. Uh, long ago, I I worked at a child abuse prevention sort of crisis line. It's called the Talk Line in San Francisco. And it's a place where people could call if they they didn't know where to turn, were in danger of abusing their their kids. Um, and it was a place that they could get, you know, we were counselors on the talk line and counseled parents. And we um, also would be able to provide resources um, where they could go. Do we have anything like that in Multnomah County that's sort of a a place for people to call and get connected or try to stop prevention before, you know, in that in that sense? Yes, there is a line. Um, there is Reach Out Oregon, and they do have their website, reachoutoregon.org. They also have a warm line um, that parents and providers can call where they can be connected with other parents and other supports within Oregon when they're, you know, maybe it's they're just having a tough day or maybe they're yeah. facing some serious risk factors and stress factors. So really being able to connect with people in their community. 
That's awesome. That's great. Thank you for for all of your incredible work. And um, yeah, the work ahead is cut out for all of us, but I'm so glad you're here today. Commissioner Vega Peters. Thank you, Chair. I just want to thank all of you for um, bringing this proclamation forward and for um, just you know sharing with us today all the work that you're doing through the either the DA's office or CARES Northwest or the um, work that you're doing with with victims in um, in this. I mean, it is, and I appreciate um, uh, Commissioner Myron's questions about what's happening right now because I think that's weighing on all of our minds. It what it did when we did this. When we had this discussion last year and we were just starting to to get into the pandemic and staying at home and really worried about what the impacts were going to be for children when they weren't in school um and they and they and we didn't have the the conduit of of reaching for help and getting help for the kids when when these situations came up and then um knowing the additional burdens of stress and you know that has been borne out and i do appreciate um the concern of like, do we have the capacity to serve all these children when when school comes back in the fall full time and we're seeing the impacts of it? Um, and I think that's something that we all have to think about how we're going to respond to. Um, but I do appreciate John. I appreciated your your opening comments and some of the positivity about um, that you had about ways that we can invest, that we can look at ACEs, we can be working upstream, we can be um, doing you know looking at all the ways that we're we're. Um, working to prevent some of this and to change the dynamics that we're seeing. And I know that the county has been, you know, a, a big partner in that work through the work that we do in DCHS and we'll continue to do that. Um, so I, I do appreciate that, but I just thank you guys for bringing this forward. And um, this is a really important proclamation that we do. Thank you. Commissioner Stick. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John, uh, and all of you who presented today. I, this is such a, a challenging conversation to to digest and just to know that so many of our children and families are suffering uh, and especially uh, during the pandemic. I'm wondering, is there any opportunity uh, to address the increased caseload uh, with the federal funding uh, like the ARPA or are there any other opportunities to build more capacity on our side? Um. So I do think there's opportunities with ARPA. Um, uh, yeah, without being more, yes, uh, there, there, there is that opportunity. I know that CARES is, may not speak for Dr. Adewusi, I know that CARES is seeking uh, additional funding as well. Uh, and you all know that we get a CAMI grant, our county gets a CAMI grant uh, from the state, which we use uh, to fund various members of our MDT, including our Child Advocacy Center, CARES Northwest. I think we're using it also just to, as you may know, to shore up, um, uh, there's a, a position or two with county mental health. Um, you know, we know that resources are strapped and we're trying to sort of spread those, re those supports around. And I just have to say, and this is a little off topic, Com uh, Commissioner Stegman, but there are other members of our MDT who wanted to be here but as you've all probably noticed that now that everything is virtual, everybody's in meetings, uh, there's no downtime. Uh, so I just, we had a number of members from uh, law enforcement, mental health, schools that wanted to also be on this line and we just couldn't make it work. They believe in uh, this as well and, and I'm just sending their apologies for not uh, being here today. Thank you for highlighting uh, all of the amazing people uh, that are involved in this difficult work. And I'd just like to express my appreciation. I don't know how you all do this work day in and day out, but I'm very grateful that you do. So thank you. I want to echo my colleagues and thank each of you and your respective teams and all the um, folks that John mentioned who couldn't be here today, but um, I know that this is some of the most um, challenging taxing work that anyone can devote themselves to. And the fact that you come to work every day, day in and day out, um, says so much about your dedication and passion for keeping kids safe. Uh, thanks to your work, children and families in our community know that they have someone watching out for them and advocating for their well being. Um, especially love the story you told about the teenager who. Um, just really wanted the assurance that there was somebody on their side. So thank you for all you do and um, 
Tasia, will you please? Oh, actually, yes. Tasia, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Baker Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Kafori? Aye. The proclamation is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.